I see some friends with our Chuko in the back wearing the Diablo shirts. Um, this is beautiful. You know, our, our hometown, beautiful as well. Just, just a different kind of beautiful. We're in the Chihuahuan Desert at 4,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains next to the Rio Grande River. It's gorgeous, and this is gorgeous too, just a lot greener than, than where we are at home. And so much good has come out of San Francisco in my head. As, as I was driving from the airport, there was this battle going on between Don't Stop Believing by Journey and Master of Puppets by Metallica. The entire way. Um, we're gonna have to work on that mashup of, of a song together at some point. Thank you for welcoming us and for being here and for taking some time out of your Sunday uh, to welcome a stranger, in some cases, Emra, a friend. Uh, we've seen you before and you were there for us in that Senate race in Texas. So many of you stood up, supporting, contributing to the fundraise, program in Texas, not on yours. You really have to do something very special in our home state. And just know this I am forever grateful for that and forever grateful for this. And forever grateful for the fact that all of us are here, not because of a person, or a candidate, or a political party. We're here for this country that we love so much, that faces the greatest challenges that we have seen in our lifetimes. Let's think about this. Millones que no pueden obtener salud, o cuidado de salud, o ver un doctor. Millones más que viven bajo de la sombra de deportación, a un país que no conocen, millones más que necesitan dos o tres trabajos para sobrevivir. In this country right now, we have a crisis in our economy that works too well for too few and not well enough for too many. We have a country where tens of millions cannot see a doctor or afford medication or take their child to the therapist so that she's well enough to learn in school tomorrow. We have a country that threatens to send more than one million dreamers back to a country they do not know, whose language they do not speak, where they do not have family, and where they're there successful against those long odds. They'll be successful for that place, not here in San Francisco, not in California, not the United States of America. You have to ask yourself how we got to this point. The wealthiest, the most powerful country on the face of the planet that purports to host the greatest democracy the world or history has ever known. How did we allow this to happen? How will 30,000 of our fellow Americans lose their lives to gun violence this year? A number that you see in no other country on the face of the planet. Why do we incarcerate 2.3 million of our fellow Americans disproportionately comprised of people of color Far too many there for a non-violent drug crime. <laughs> Including possession of marijuana, a substance that is legal or decriminalized or medicinalized in most states in the union. And yet you can be stopped, frisked, arrested, locked up, upon release forced to check a box on every employment application form, saying that you have that conviction making it less likely that you get that job or qualify for a student loan so that you can improve yourself through higher education. How in the world did we come to this point? We're not inherently evil or bad or murderous or violent or unkind or cruel. We are a great people born and intended to do great things. Every other concern that I just raised, our response to that is a $2 trillion tax break. It goes to corporations that are already sitting on record piles of cash and the already wealthiest in this country at a time of historic wealth and income inequality. The people of the future, I hope, will not be able to believe that that happened. How is it that we allow members of Congress to choose their voters?
ratified by the majority of the states in this union to ensure that by our constitution, women can never be discriminated against on any basis, including pay in the workplace. And we don't need to do that when we have full economic and political democracy in this country. We will call forth the genius of every single one of our fellow Americans. And every single one of those challenges that I described at the outset, we can meet them. Not as Democrats, not as Republicans, not as folks from big cities or small towns, but just all of us, Americans. No me importa su raza, su género. I don't care to whom you pray or who you love, how many generations you've been in this country, or whether you just got here this morning. All that matters to me is that we are Americans first. We have these challenges before us, and we will overcome them. to your full potential, to go to school the next day, to work a job, to shoulder your fair share of the load so that it rests a little bit lighter on everybody else's shoulders. I want you to be able to start a punk rock band and tour the country. If that's what you're working on the planet to do. I want you to be able to raise your family. I want you to fulfill your promise in whatever way that means, but I want you to be well enough to be able to do that in this country. In the year 2019, there are still people dying of diabetes, of the flu, of curable cancers. Insulin invented in 1922, sold to the government of Canada for three bucks, three Canadian dollars at that, <laughs> with no prospect for profit because those scientists wanted to save the lives of their fellow human beings. And you now have people crowdfunding their insulin treatment rationing their care, and dying prematurely or leading diminished lives. This country, should it so choose, can be up to that challenge. We can also confront the fact that in so many states throughout this country, including in Texas, the largest provider of mental health care services is the county jail system. In fact, the largest inpatient mental health care facility in a state of 28 million, my home state, is the Harris County Jail. Folks with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, clinical depression, literally getting locked up on purpose. Not that they should, but they feel that they must in order to get care and treatment and a prescription to a psychotropic medication that will temporarily make life bearable for them at a cost on average of 110 bucks a night. Losing out 
on whatever they would be able to do in their lives, were they well enough to do it, losing out on what we pay in, and losing out on the knowledge that for a fraction of the cost, we can provide consistent, high quality mental health care. So when we talk about universal care in this country, guaranteed and high quality, let's make sure that means access to a primary care provider, a mental health care provider, Maternal mortality crisis, three times as deadly for women of color in a country throughout the United States that is closing choices to women, making it harder not only to obtain a legal abortion, but a cervical cancer screening, to see a family planning provider, to see a doctor or provider of any kind. That when we say universal health care, we also mean every woman's ability to make her own decisions about her own body. land of immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees from the world over. Given where we are, we might recall the Irish in the 19th century, the O'Rourke's among them, fleeing famine, no place to go at a time that had claimed the lives of more than one million people in that country. And this was the one place that took them in. Vietnamese in the 1970s People from every part of this planet, from Asia, from Africa, from the Western Hemisphere today, people traveling 2,000 miles from the deadliest countries on the face of the planet right now, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, doing what you would do, doing what I would do if it were the only way to save the life of my child. Yeah. The beast. And coming here, penniless, afraid, strangers in a strange land, and the way that we chose to meet them. Though this was a decision of one man, of one party, in this democracy, where the people are the government, and the government is the people, we can take no comfort in that. It is on every single one of us. And we deport that mother back to the country from which she fled, lock that child up in a cage, turn that kid over to Health and Human Services, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, a foster care home in God literally only knows where, visiting a cruelty and a torture on that child, the scars of which they still show even when they are reunited. And we have been there in El Paso, Texas, at Annunciation House, where after months, an eight-year-old girl is reunited with her mom after that separation. And unlike Henry, my eight-year-old, when I come back from being on the road, big goofy smile on his face. And that she associates her mother with the worst pain that a human being can ever feel and will not open up that heart again, at least anytime soon, lest she feel that pain all over again. That is what we are doing in this country right now. On the day that we announced our campaign in El Paso, three blocks south from where I am, where we were, near the Paso del Norte Bridge, our president had kept behind concertina wire and chain link fence, entire families underneath a bridge living in the dirt in this country, with such great capacity and resources and a tradition of welcoming people from the world over who made this the greatest place on the planet, bar none, the world over. So what for us to meet this challenge now? Let's define us forever. Begin by ensuring that never again is another child taken from another mother or father out of the world. Strong, forever free them from any fear of deportation by making them U.S. citizens in this country. Do not do it at the price of supporting their parents, on millions more working their toughest jobs, bringing 
bring them out of the shadows, give them a chance to contribute even more to our shared success. We do not need a 2,000 mile, 30 foot high, $30 billion wall. We need to be good to one another, treat each other with decency and respect and dignity. Así podemos asegurar nuestras comunidades y este país. this country's immigration laws in our own image to reflect us, those who are here right now, understanding that our future is premised on our ability to accept and integrate those who chose us, who left their home, their family, their language, their culture, to start again here, to do better for themselves and their kids, but to do better for us and they have. We can do that, and I know that that defies partisanship I know that that defies geography. I know that that defies the differences between us now. And then this, the mother of all challenges, which you are too well aware of. One degree Celsius just since 1980 is how much this planet has warmed, and it is cooking still right now on track to warm another three or four degrees Celsius. If you think 400,000 apprehensions at our southern border last year was a problem, Wait until some countries in the Western Hemisphere can no longer support human life, then we might have a problem. For two weeks, the people of this community were wearing masks on their face last year because of the smoke that came here from wildfires that raged at historic levels. For as long as we've been keeping records in California and North America, these fires defied every single one of those records. Just like back home in Texas, 58 inches of rain fell from the sky, landed on Houston, Texas, washed people out of their homes, out of their very lives. The third 500-year flood in just the last five years. We were just in Iowa, where the Missouri flooded its banks. The greatest runoff into the Missouri River Basin for as long as we've been keeping records. Four times the normal runoff. Droughts in the Panhandle, where we attempt to grow the food that feeds us and so much of the rest of the world. This is not caused by God or Mother Nature. It is our own excesses, our own emissions, and our own inaction in the face of the facts and the science and the truth. And so it's on us, every single one of us, to make this work, to free ourselves from dependence on fossil fuels, to transition to solar and wind and geothermal and renewable energies, to allow our rural communities to do their part, meaning that farmers, let's give them a chance through the Farm Bill to plant cover crops, to pull more of that carbon out of the air, open up new technologies like precision tilling that disturbs less of the carbon that's in the soil. And the next president must, in addition, Yademas, then rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, enforcing, enforcing the design protocols. We've got to make sure that the example of our leadership extends beyond that every single purchasing decision, leasing decision, that the federal government makes should include the cost of pollution and the cost to our climate. No more leases on federal lands for oil and gas drilling. And let's make sure that those leases that are in force right now are changed to reflect the true cost and the royalties that are paid, and then, just maybe, we can take our role as the indispensable nation, convene the powers of the planet, bring them together to do the otherwise impossible, and save not just this generation, but every generation that comes. These challenges, these opportunities, cannot be met by half measure, or by only half the country. It's going to take all of us. And this is our moment to decide how we will be defined. Are we going to define ourselves by kids in cages, by withdrawing from the Paris climate agreements, by calling Nazis and Klansmen very fine people? No, we're not going to be defined by our smallness, our pettiness, our hatred, or our racism. Instead, we will be known by our ambitions, our aspirations, the work the service and sacrifice we are willing to bring to bear to get them done. And that is what brought me here to tell you that I'm willing to serve you as the next president. And
So let me address this, this issue of, of turnout and, and define um, the legacy of segregation and Jim Crow and racism and voter suppression that is alive and well in our democracy. Today I talked about Texas. Um, Texas was 50th on purpose, designed that way. They, they got exactly what they wrote. In our race that so many of you helped us with in Texas, we went to each of the 254 counties we talked about the issues that you just raised. We talked about gun violence, and we talked about the solution. Universal background checks and stop selling weapons of war into our communities. AR-15s, machines designed and created for effectively, efficiently, and great numbers should no longer be sold in the American communities. Keep them on the battle. We talked about universal health care. We talked about the maternal mortality crisis that was especially deadly in Texas, and about how Planned Parenthood and reproductive choice is part of the solution to that challenge. And I would say in the reddest places on the planet that you can see glowing from outer space when you're orbiting the Earth, I would say it in the big cities, um, because it's just true. And, and here's part of the result. Again, thank you for the help in doing this. Young voter turnout in Texas up 500%. 500%. We didn't our sales, we didn't compromise our values, we showed up with the courage of our convictions, and I'll tell you what, it, it worked not just with Democrats, not just independents. It's the first time in 10 years that a statewide Democrat won independent votes. We also won 500,000 Republican votes who voted for Greg Abbott, a very Tea Party conservative Republican governor, and voted for us on the same ballot. So I, I have to think that these issues are universal. Protecting the lives in our lives through ending gun violence, making sure everybody's well enough to live to their full potential, reproductive freedoms and following the law of the land set in 1973, Roe versus Wade. What I hope to be able to tell you is that though we didn't win the race, we lost by 2.6% for those of you who were counting. And we were counting that night. All of us together not only increased turnout to record levels, not just put 38 electoral college votes in play in 2020, but Además, in addition, we helped to flip the House of Representatives. Two new members of Congress from Texas, Democrats, holding seats in long-held Republican districts, changed the composition of the state legislature, and in Harris County, home to Houston, Texas, 17 African-American women won judicial elections, literally changing the face of criminal justice in the largest city in Texas, the most diverse city in the United States of America. I'm telling you that we can run on this proud progressive agenda everywhere in the United States of America, unite people instead of dividing them, ensure that everyone sees a future for themselves in the future of this country. Thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Thanks. transitioning our economy off of fossil fuels. So in 2015, President Obama blocked the Keystone XL pipeline, citing uh, climate as the reason, and Trump reversed that decision, but the pipeline hasn't been built. So if given the opportunity as president, would you stand with indigenous peoples and block the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline? <laughs> The answer is yes. Thank you for asking the question. Let, let's stand with all the stakeholders. Um, let's stand with indigenous communities. Standing up and doing that. Appreciate it. All right, can you go to the next question? Hey, Kendall. I want to know how you feel about the Republican Party and
Because they can leverage contributions from those corporations who do business before their committees of jurisdiction, and it helps to explain results that are otherwise inexplicable. In 2017, your Congress passed a bill signed into law by this president that allows internet service providers to take your private browsing data and sell it to committee contributions and checks, bar lobbyists from being able to contribute to the campaigns of those that they will be before arguing for policy, but let us together help to finance the campaigns of people who are willing to raise money, grassroots five, ten, fifteen dollars at a time. So yes, let's do that. That can be part of the solution. Thank you. Change the outcome of an election 
invited by the person who's now the President of the United States to do that. I don't know if collusion is a term of art in the law, but he certainly invited their participation and then sought to obstruct the investigation into what has happened and has yet to acknowledge that we were under attack in 2016, 2018, and will be in 2020. So yes, let's make sure that Fox News, Facebook, Twitter, every channel from which we receive information about those like me who ask for our votes or those like him who hold these positions of public trust are held accountable. And in our laws, we need to make those distinctions much more clear than they are today. The reporting, the transparency, the sunshine, so that you can make informed decisions about where your news comes from and what your lawmakers are doing in your name, all that is essential for this democracy to continue to function. Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> Christopher Johnigan, and I'm from Hayward, California. Um, my, my question has to do with, um, well, under the previous administration, Obama, with um, Attorney General Eric Holder, they seem to be doing everything they could to try and increase oversight of troublesome police departments. But now the consent decrees um, in order to, um, for that oversight of the police departments have been rolled back first uh, with um, President Trump, with the now departed Attorney General Jeff Sessions. I mean. Police should be treated with respect, but at the same time, you can't, they should not be allowed to do whatever they want by saying, he reached for his waistband or I thought he had a gun. <laughs> so I just want to know what would you, as president, what would you do to make sure that law enforcement would treat poor communities, black communities, with respect? Yeah. Thank you for your comments. And so I appreciate the question and the way in which you asked it. The acknowledgement that sheriff's deputies, police officers have very tough, very important jobs for which we give them our thanks. But the jobs are so important, the trust they hold so sacred, that when that is violated, there must be consequences, there must be accountability, and there must be justice. No person, regardless of who they are or the badge that they wear, is above or below the law in this country. The federal government has the opportunity through the money that it spends municipal and county police and sheriff's departments to ensure that there's accountability and transparency for use of force and against whom force is used. You mentioned our civil rights uh, mandates through the Department of Justice that President Obama perhaps did not use to their full effect and effort, and President Trump has completely turned his back on them. When you add to that a war on drugs, uh, now approaching its 50th year, that has become a war on people, some people more than others. And I talked about who is disproportionately locked up in this country right now. It is disproportionately people of color. And it's not just a function of policing or our court system, although we need to address that. It's also our school system. At four or five years old, in a kindergarten classroom, a child of color is five times as likely to be disciplined or suspended or expelled as a white kid. That schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline begins not in high school, but in kindergarten. You cannot be more vulnerable than you are as a four or five year old. And we are doing that to one another right now. I mentioned the maternal mortality crisis in this country, three times as bad for women of color. There is a disparity in infant mortality in the United States today, in the year 2019, that is greater between white America and black America in this year than it was in 1850. 15 years before the abolition of slavery. There is 10 times the wealth in white America today than there is in black America. Although we could argue, and this would be true, that the ancestors of many people in this country who are people of color built the wealth of this country in the first place. There's no prospect of being able to enjoy it. And so whether it's healthcare, whether it's our educational system, whether it's our criminal justice system, this country, fundamentally, structurally, has been set up to favor some against others. And until we address this holistically, stare squarely in the face the consequences of slavery and segregation and Jim Crow and the continuing suppression that we see everywhere in this country, 
We will not get to the underlying issue that you describe unarmed black men being killed in this country far too often with impunity and without justice. So we must do it all, but we can start where you asked us to, and I will. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, Peter. My name is Anil and I live in Palo Alto, California. And, you know, I'm a brown guy living in Northern California. It's easy to see all the issues that I would care about, whether it's sustainable development, inclusive growth, environment, guns, all of that fun stuff. Right? And yet, and yet, nobody's going to get anything done after this election if we don't appeal to a broader mass of people and cut across lines. Every word that you said today has the risk of being received by other voters, not like me, through the twisted filters of right-wing media. How are you going to cut through that clutter and cut through that narrative to actually reach other voters? Who shows their ability, show their ability to, get, to reach the other side in Texas? But it's, it's going to be a really hard challenge. What, what's the plan for that? Thank you for asking the question. Um, let, let, me, let me just begin in, in the most personal of terms. Uh, my mom is a lifelong Republican. And we got her to vote for me in this last election. So I, I know that it's cause for optimism. I know that we can do this. You know, I mentioned going to every one of the 254 counties of Texas. And, and we went not just to say that we went to every one of the 254 counties of Texas, but uh, just as I said at the outset of this meeting, I have, I have no hope of being able to serve you if I've not first heard you and listened to you and sought to understand you. And so going to a place like King County, uh, county seat is uh, Guthrie, Texas. Um, voted for Donald Trump 96% in the last election. Yet every bit is deserving of being heard, of being listened to, of being fought for, of being served. So we showed up, and guess what? Guthrie is one of the 50 water systems in the state of Texas where you cannot drink the water. If I had not shown up there, then they would not have known that I cared about their problems and that I wanted to find a solution for them as their senator. And look, we may have picked up a total of two or three votes in Guthrie, Texas <laughs> with that visit, but it, but it made me a better candidate. It made me a better public servant going forward. Um, you know, have so much in common. If, if we choose not to write each other off or take each other for granted, I really think there's no stopping us. Henrietta, Texas, another one of these conservative towns, um, this Republican family sitting, enjoying their cinnamon roll and coffee on a Sunday morning, recognized me because I've been in Wichita Falls the night before, and they'd seen me on the news, and they said, hey, sit down, tell us what you're all about. And the dad says, look, I'm really concerned about Obamacare. In fact, I'm really pissed off about Obamacare. Cannot afford the premiums that we're paying right now. So I want you to do something about it, but I do not want you to repeal it, because before Obamacare, we had no health care at all. And so we, we had this conversation about how can we improve what we have right now. And before I can finish my thought to him, his wife kind of elbows me. Now, she's a public school teacher. And in Texas, public school teachers and educators and cafeteria workers and counselors and librarians and school bus drivers, on average, are working two or three jobs just to make ends meet. On average, are taking out of their pockets nearly a thousand bucks to pay for school supplies and that dinner for the kid on free and reduced breakfast and lunch who does not have a meal to go home to, buys a new set of clothes for the kid who's shown up in the same jeans and t-shirt Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, by Thursday, knowing that that kid's ability to learn is connected to his sense of self-worth and dignity. Out of her own pocket, though she's not paid enough, buys him a new set of clothes. And so she's one of those school teachers. She's a Republican. And she says to me, Beto, listen, look at me. If you let Betsy DeVos take my hard-earned tax dollars out of my public school classroom, turn them into a voucher, send them to a private school, I will hunt you down. I will find you. I will get you. And so maybe we found some, some common cause by, by sitting together eating that sweet roll in, in Henrietta, Texas. Um, that's the same way that I've been campaigning all across the country so far. Going everywhere, never asking your partisan affiliation, um, your, your immigration status, whether you can even vote. You know, you may have a, a conviction, you may still be on parole. I don't care. You're my fellow American. I want to find out how you're 